Hello, everybody. Welcome to the latest episode of the Two Fish at the Table Poker Podcast. As you might have picked up from various hints that we've said over the past couple of years, uh, there is a third one of us. You know, we have, we're, we're two brothers. We'll be a third brother, my twin brother, and he tutors math on Saturdays. Today happens to be Saturday, and so I wanted to show you, Sam, one of the math problems that he would have shown shown his kids today. I want you to solve for y. Y would equal three. Is that right? That's right. You solved for why. Very good. Welcome, everyone, to our latest episode, where this time we're going to be reviewing the 2021 main event. That's right. There were more main events after 2020. It's been more than like a dozen episodes since we've reviewed the main event. So we're both really excited to be doing this. Uh, I'm your host, East Coast Sam on Poker Stars. Yeah, I never would have thought, let's have been on Poker Stars, never would have thought we would have circled all the way back and actually had a brand new episodic breakdown of a, of a main event in America to talk about um you know this this was the uh, the first year of what is kind of the cbs sports network era of the world to the poker main event and uh, this these 15 episodes just kind of dropped on put go uh out of nowhere they, they took off the live uh breakdowns of each day on the on that original live feed broadcast for sometime this year i think and so we were always like, oh yeah, let's definitely look at the, let's get back to our roots. This podcast we had straight off the beaten path that we had sowed for ourselves. Now we're back uh, for kind of a retro, not quite retro uh, style podcast here. So I'm excited. I have a lot to say about those main events, uh, and it's funny because this one began from day four onward. And as I mentioned in our while ago, back in uh, episode nine or ten. Uh, I sort of checked out mentally a bit after those first three days of that main event, given that Adam, our friend Adam Grosak, had been playing in the main event for those first three days. So really, a lot of the stories and the players running deep was kind of new to me. I mean, I remember two, one, obviously, and a few other things. But uh, it was good to kind of have the other half of the uh, main event story filled in my brain by watching these, even though I have some good and some bad to talk about with this, uh, with this 15 episode collection. Yeah, same here. I mean, it was exciting to come back to the main event after such a long time. We started the podcast here. We were very, we're both very enthusiastic about the main event, of course. Uh, yeah, I mean, I misspoke in last episode. I said that Poker Go was the one who put this content out. It was actually CBS Sports and a new arrangement uh, with the WSOP to do this. But Poker Go obviously is hosting the content, I think was involved a little bit in producing it. Uh, so yeah, I mean, it's an interesting style. Uh, we've talked in the years past about how the style changes from year to year. There's the sort of golden era, which is about 03 to 06, and then they changed it in 07. And then, you know, gradually there were more and more changes as time goes on. This one is fairly similar to the main event, uh, you know, from like 2016 to 2019 in terms of how things are presented. The graphics are obviously pretty different. There's some different uses of music. There's also a new set for the interviews where the player, there's one player who's kind of sitting on a stool and kind of just like off on his own. It feels like he's on an island away from everybody else. And there's, you know, screens and things behind him. There's also another interview set up where it's just the traditional, he's sitting in front of a green screen talking. Uh, so, you know, there's a few little stylistic changes. Also, Jeff Platt is the field reporter instead of Kara Scott, uh, but serves a lot of the same purpose as she did, interviewing players, offering some more information about it. And then when the final table happens, actually going and standing on the rail and talking to some people, which was kind of nice. So yeah, we'll get into obviously all of that in each episode. I remember, you know, some stuff from 2021. I was, you know, here in, here in my home, so I was able to watch quite a bit of it. And there were certain players that caught my eye, and I was curious to see how their edits would turn out. We'll get into that. But yeah, I mean, going into this, I was more interested in seeing the style of the CBS news coverage, uh, less so than the actual players and what happened, because I knew what happened. So. Yeah, and you know, we have discussed this main event a bit in episodes past, you know, that, that back in that year, 2021. But to, 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 just to uh, refresh everyone's memories, so this was the first main event after the pandemic year. Right. Uh, 6,650 players. So kind of in that wheelhouse that the 08 to 2016 main event had kind of settled into the, the mid-6,000s. $8 million for first place. Uh, again, close but slightly below maybe the non-McKeon years of of the the you know the era of the main event at that time. Uh, multiple day ones, I think six day ones, sixty k starting stack, big blind ante, two hour levels. That's all the same. Uh, and 
three major featured tables, the main TV table, uh, table two, and then table three, which unlike table one and two did not have the uh, on, on screen graphics, which was, was, was the case in the, in, in the live uh, broadcast of the last two main events on CBS Sports Network, Sox Poker Go. And so instead of showing the cards, they would normally just kind of show like a graphic of the player's name, the cards they have. And it just kind of be this almost raw sort of just like panning of the, of the table as the board runs out, usually after an all-in or something. Uh, but tables one and two, you'd have the, ta- the, the names, chip counts, blinds, everything at the top of the screen. And this was not a abridged, expunged version from like 2019. This was... Uh, the same footage from like the raw feed, but then Lana Norm are like, you know, the, the typical classic main event style where they're talking about an episode as if it's live, even though it was filmed after the fact. And so uh, they're a bit, a bit more in that sort of classic Lana Norm flow of dialogue and of, of the jokes and the back and forth. That's all pretty much back to normal. Uh, I guess it, it's fairly similar. To, if you just combine 2018 and 2019, and 2022 and 2021 into a big ball, you would get this. And, you know, we had talked about how really on average, the last like six or seven main events really were, were below the average that the, the classic era kind of had, had established. And this for me, I'm going to have myself here, but this one, this one falls below the majority of the classic and modern main events, but above the worst two. It's kind of, for yeah. me, it's kind of third worst. Yeah, I mean, again, the issue is just, it just comes off as a little too clean, a little too factory made. With 03 to 06, it really felt like they were building stories that were really invested in poker and selling it to the public. And then really around 07, that sort of attitude starts to fall off a little bit. And now by this point, I don't really really, even really understand why CBS Sports would buy this uh, if they didn't really seem that interested in it. Again, Lun and Norm are totally fine. There's no problem with them. I don't mind Jeff Platt either. He doesn't knock my socks off or anything, but he's a fine sideline reporter. It's just the overall attitude I get from it. Uh, we get quite a few interviews in each episode letting us learn about each player, but we don't really learn about any of them particularly in depth. There's a lot of narratives that's just kind of spoon fed to us and we're expected to accept, but it's not really proven or shown to us very well who these players are and what they're like. And also, I mean, just the luck who winds up winning, who winds up making the final table and what their personalities are like also just doesn't doesn't work well for entertainment for this one. In previous main events, you know, Queen Win winning it created this great story, created this big, you know, flashy heads up match. That's not really the case here. Again, there's some people I like their edits. Uh, We'll get into that. But for the most part, it's just kind of eh. Still, still not terrible, but yeah, it's just, just you know, it, it's funny because there are like three glaring, huge flaws in this main event, but it began for me so strong. Mm-hmm. Like I was cut off guard by how much I loved the first two episodes. I thought it got off to a great start, and then it just completely flatlined for me there. So those those main three issues are one is the table three and outer table actions is a total entertainment dead zone. Having just having the, the person's name with what their cards are. And we don't really get like a great view of the board. It's just hard to really kind of mentally put the hand together in your head when you're watching it. And I just felt so emotionally detached from what was happening on, during those bits. So really, um, it, luckily when, you know, when, when the field shrinks to two tables and one table, that, that's completely gone. But just every time I pan to the outer tables or table three, I was just like, not this is not not fun to watch. Let me have the classic graphics. Just let, you know because you can you can put that in after the fact. You don't have to um, just you know use the exact same stuff they would have for the raw version. That's the whole point of having this edited version. So that was a huge flaw for me. Number two is some of the narratives that begin in the first couple episodes. Money makers resurgence. A um, couple of players on the on the on some of the tables. Really excited to see them make it running a deep. And then so much of their action gets skipped off screen in between the time span that the episodes cover. So, right. for instance, uh, from day four to day five, um, episode the first episode for day five doesn't cover the very beginning of day five. There's a lot of stuff that was skipped in between there. And that and we'll get to who that who was eliminated off screen, but that just shocked me that they would that they would edit it like that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, what you said about cutting away from the first two tables to focus on the third table in the field out is totally accurate. I mean, we mostly just get bust outs 
whenever we're cutting away from the big two tables. And, and when you have a bust out hand, all right, it could be a little exciting to see them busting out, I suppose, especially in the back half of the tournament where every bust out matters as you're getting closer to the final table. But it also robs it of any narrative drama because we don't know the context that led up to that bust out. A lot of it seems to be pre-flop, which is never super exciting to see. Uh, you know, maybe every now and again, we see a player like make a good call on the river or call off a bluff or something. That's again, not super exciting because we don't have all the context for it. Yeah. And the narratives just throughout are just very strange. I mean, in the first episode, we have moneymaker, we have players that we know who are personable and we see some interesting hands with them, but then, yeah, there's just too much stuff that's left off screen or just not followed up enough. And instead we get a lot of time with a lot of other hands that just aren't really that exciting as well. Yeah, uh, and, and then I guess my third biggest problem is just how much of of the like a couple specific players that get a lot of attention um, towards the end of their story, not not up until that point. So Dragon Alim, for example, she's kind of like hyped up in the early episodes, but, but we barely she's barely in the episode in the, in the entire season at all. Even though I, I think that they could have really um, capitalized on her story, for example. Now there's some there's some great hands in this collection. And the pacing is definitely better than uh, those, you know, 2019, 2018 hands that, that we hated so much. Uh, so again, it's it's a, it's a, it's still it's a better version of you know a couple of years uh, earlier in the chronology, but uh, it's it's like they really they really had. I, I I like the formula. I thought Lana Norm's dialogue was was on point the whole season. It felt it mm -hmm. felt back to normal, back to business, and uh, you know I, I I was actually okay with the setup of just the the graphics and all, all the, the slight changes i was in favor of all of them and but then just when the, putting the whole package together just didn't, didn't quite live up to some of its parts absolutely yeah i mean yeah there's a lot of good lawn and norm stuff throughout uh again there's you know some stuff that's sort of spoon fed to us there's this weird joke that sort of runs in and out through all these episodes with jack oliver who spoiler like gets third place and you know norm keeps asking like who is this guy like what is he known for and lawn will reel off some fact and it, they, they do it like five or six times. Like it just keeps coming up over and over again. But Jack Oliver doesn't say anything. It doesn't do anything exciting at the table. That's what I mean by narratives being spoon fed to us instead mm -hmm. of being shown to us. It's like, you know, why are you picking on this guy for not, you know, he, he wants yeah. to keep to himself clearly. Why are you doing this this thing? But yeah, there's a lot of law and norm stuff that does work. And I'll point this out as time goes on. But yeah. Uh, a couple other points to note here is that uh, the major sponsor for this season was Solve for Y, right. uh, which would get a small little clip in each episode, not nearly as long as, say, like the uh, past advertisement for like the Player of the Year did in the old main event, something like that. Very quick. And the, the timing of, of that was pretty funny because I'd watched one of Doug Polk's recent uh, videos where he totally just like tore apart uh, Matt Berkey and like the the efficacy of like advertising itself or why as if like like there are these big successful poker players that can help you when a lot of the players in the organization have less than su substantial uh poker tournament results so it was a little interesting little timing for that and then this main event also got rid of the the oversized half a million dollar chips they went right from the lavender 100ks to the yellow 1 million chips which is uh, interesting. I'm a little surprised because you, you figure for certain blind levels, you kind of want to have a half a million dollar chips in there. But just, you know, that observation, we always, I always love mentioning the chips uh, year to year. And this was, again, the last year that the main event was held in the Rio. So the entirety of those classic chips no longer matter. Obviously, the 2022 main event had new chips for Bally's, which I hated, but that's a different story. But, you know. Yeah, they still have the $5 million chips, which I don't like because just optically, I just like seeing huge piles of chips. You know, $1 million chips, just a bunch of yellow chips. Uh, yeah. whatever. Too bad. And so uh, let's not forget that, that the, the bubble for this main event was the last 1,000 players. So day four began with 1,000 players left, but episode one doesn't begin until uh, part way into day four. So only 545 players are left with the blind 6K, 12K. Uh, Adam lost in the 2.5k 5k level, so uh, you can see how far away he was from getting to this part of the action. Moneymaker headlines the featured table number one, mm -hmm. uh, and then table two has a guy with the last name Fishman. Interesting. Uh, Jason Kuhn, Jack Oliver, Chance Corneth, Matt Berkey, and uh, this uh, very talkative—I call her Lady Kasuf Brant at the yeah. table. And so, and then table three has George Holmes and David Tuckman. And so I 
this first episode, I was just like so thrilled with this episode. I thought I thought it was light years above anything from 2018 and 2019. I didn't, I didn't think the hands selection was super amazing, but there was just it was just fun to watch. There was great table talk. There was great meaningful action, and I was just really really pumped on this first episode. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Brand, uh, you know. I don't want to be mean comparing her to Will Kasuf. She's a kinder, kinder Will Kasuf. I mean, yeah, talking a lot with Jason Kuhn. And Jason Kuhn props to him for talking back to Brandon and actually engaging her in conversation. You know, some players might be afraid of giving information away, but he seems willing to to chat it up with her. And they seem to have an interesting rapport in several hands. <laughs> uh, Lon and Norm also get in some good lines about, you know, how many times Brand says hello to people and all that. It's very nice. And then, yeah, Moneymaker is just so naturally personable you know, greatest poker ambassador of all time, right? So just to see him play and actually do fairly well, even though he gets lucky in a bunch of spots too, yes. uh, it's really nice. Yeah, I mean, he, he I'm going to make her accumulate a huge stack with the blinds like 6K, 12K, 8K, 16K. He's got multi-million dollar, multi-million multi of chips on his, at, at the table. And uh, the, it's Chris Moneymaker. I mean, what better way to get back to the main events in a sense than going to where it all began with Moneymaker at the TV table? I mean, that's just... That's just pretty cool. It is pretty cool. Yeah. I mean, they had a brief sort of flashback montage at the start of the episode to go over the first three days. And you get little clips of everybody. Of course, the clip that, you know, has to be everyone's favorite is when Phil Helmuth shows up <laughs> dressed up. It's just great. I always love seeing that. Uh, yeah. But yeah, I mean, Moneymaker is, is, you know, definitely the star of this episode. Again, just, you know, getting lucky in a lot of spots, uh, really mixing it up with people, willing to talk with people. It's, it's exciting to see. Yeah, and you know, uh, there's a few players shown on the outer tables, uh, including one that I met that year, Mike Matisau, uh, in our infamous video. <laughs> he busts in this episode, so we kind of makes it into day four, but not too too deep. But again, Moneymaker and Matisau had cashed in three consecutive regular main events, so this uh, was a part of that uh, you know trilogy of uh, success there. And again, nothing super incredibly amazing, but just a really fun episode to get the ball rolling. And it really planted these heightened expectations in my head for the whole season. And, and even though, again, I, I wasn't super on board with with the, the the spectating style of Table 3 with the graphics appearing, I, I was okay in this first time just because, oh, yeah, that's, that's how they do it now uh, for the live live footage. So I, I was okay if it, in that moment. Uh, little did I know that would probably get a little bit worse. And so episode two is the second part of day four. They only they break that day four into two days. They'll expand upon days five, six, and seven a bit more. And so uh, by the end of day four, we're down to 292 players. Uh, Moneymaker kind of has a little bit of a reversal of fortune. So he goes from a big stack, he loses half his stack, basically with uh, not being able to full ace against aces, which is, again, hard to do. So you can't blame it too bad. But again, it's, it's a money maker. you got to make those moves sometimes. Um, Brandon Fishman on table two and Brant both uh, bust, unfortunately. Uh, Brant gets very unlucky, and Fishman gets really unlucky to run into aces with kings. So uh, some some big hands run into other hands, which at, at this point in the tournament, I do enjoy seeing in, in a sense that it's, you know, some – poker action obviously i feel bad if someone on like day seven has that problem but here the money jumps on is big and so i don't feel as bad for them because it's you know it's still a nice run to be there alive at day four absolutely yeah it's it's tough to see brand go but she does take it as well as she can uh and definitely everybody seems to really like her mm -hmm. uh yeah you know it's compared i just, just saw this in my notes just Brand busts and you see her super affable and then it cuts to Mike Madison wow. who has busted and he's just sitting there in his chair and hasn't left the room. That that juxtaposition is just really funny. That was a good editing choice by their part. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, Moneymaker sort of, I don't want to say punting his stack away, but making mistakes that he could have avoided definitely seems to be a recurring element throughout this main event. So, you know, it's it's kind of, again, a nice little sort of thematic thing to put in at the beginning, you know, Moneymaker losing his chips because we're going to see that quite often. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, but, but for me, table two was the absolute highlight of day four yeah. of the episodes. I was really happy that we got such a great table. And again, I, we know a couple of these players just here in there. Matt Berkey, Jason Kuhn, Moneymaker. You know, there's some, some decent names alive in the tournament. Chance Corneth is in there. So I, I was happy with the, with the quote-unquote star power of the field at this time, even if, you know, um, we'll see how, how much that star power carries to day five. But uh, again, 
two solid, not, not perfect, but very solid episodes for day four, which led us into a two-part day five, where unfortunately uh, it, the, the, the narratives I thought were building in the those first two episodes really kind of fell apart here because Moneymaker and Kui Win, two of the highlighted uh, past main event champions that were still in, get eliminated before the action of episode three even begins. And I, that, it was just one of the biggest killjoys I've had watching these main events. And uh, I don't know how you feel about that, though. No, I'm with you. I mean, it's just, you just throw it in, oh, they busted. You know, here are these two stars of the game, you know, we've shown in the first two episodes. They're gone, you know, moving right along. Uh, you know, maybe they just didn't get footage of their bust outs. They were at the outer tables. Maybe they just couldn't quite cobble together a narrative. Would have still been nice to have had a little bit more context. And yeah, this episode in general, I mean, yeah, Jason Kuhn also busts in this episode. So that's kind of unfortunate after all the time we spent with him in the previous two episodes. Just really not that much to it. I mean, we see some stuff from George Holmes mixed in here, but he doesn't really do anything that exciting. He doesn't get out of line. Mm-hmm. You know, just kind of a blah episode. Yeah, you know, George Holmes, he's, he's, he's pretty present for most of this entire season, but he just doesn't do much besides getting crippled on day seven. And we don't even see most of that story. We'll get to that in a minute. Um, episode, episode three is definitely where the shine is. I mean, it definitely kind of was gone for me, which is funny. It only took one episode to, to take away the shine of two episodes. So it's like, you know, a negative is a lot more powerful on you than two positives can be. And you know, one of my favorite parts of the kind of 2010 onward main events was the outer table action because of more tables, you're just you're more likely to run into these crazy hands or arguments or runouts or explosions of, of emotion. And for the majority of these episodes, I just have no notes for the outer tables because not only are they barely shown, when they are shown, it's usually just some forgettable, you know, ace queen, ace of hearts, queen of diamonds, all in against king queen. Like it's just. And we can't see the board appropriately. We can't really see both players as they react to it. So it just doesn't really work for me in the slightest. So, uh, and again, it, and it's we're lucky that at least it's not an even split of tables one, two, three out of tables. It's mostly just one and two. But uh, when when one quarter of your potential poker actions of entertainment dead zone, it's just really not a good start for you. For, yeah, I mean, I don't really know how they do things on a production angle with the outer tables. I imagine they just have camera crews going around and then, you know, Hey, on table six, this is happening. And then they send a crew over. I mean, they really need to have a better system for that so that we have more context for each hand. Obviously it's impossible to have a camera crew at each and every single table, but I mean, you know, maybe have the dealer signal something, or I don't know, so that we can have more of this footage and more context for everything. Have the cameraman stand behind the dealer as they're, flipping over the cards so we can see the board properly, things like that. I mean, one other thing about this episode is that Henry Park, who makes the final tables introduced, and, you know, they keep mentioning how he was uh, in the Marines or something, and he becomes a sort of featured player throughout. But again, he just doesn't do anything that exciting. I mean, he has aces when Chidwick has queen eight and manages to, you know, get some chips off at Chidwick. You know, nothing super exciting. I mean, I, I was really looking forward to seeing some great narratives in this main event. And by ha- pretty much all of them just got cut short. Jason Kuhn also bust. He was, right. you know, a big part of those day four episodes. So really, like, just all the gr- narrative grammar that had been laid in day four just kind of gets cut at the bud right here. And now we're left to pick up the pieces from that point on. Uh, fortunately, episode four, the back half of day five... Uh, I actually thought it was a pretty good episode. We get some uh, some new players on the featured tables here. Um, we get Rigby, Dirty Duck for Rigby, uh, in, on Table 1. It's really kind of a Rigby spotlight episode on Table 1, which is good considering the tension we'll get later. And uh, there's just some pretty good action all across the whole the whole episode on, on both of those tables. George Holmes gets a good bluff shove in against Jason Chidwick. I mean, not, um, Stephen Chidwick. What is his first name again? Yeah. Yeah, Stephen Chidwick. Uh, Chidwick makes a, you know, we see him downtrends, which, you know, he's a top player. So it's, you know, it's action nonetheless. I mean, it doesn't play terribly, just that, you know, some sort of hands go against him. And uh, Rigby, uh, with it, just loving the three deuce or the deuce deuce, uh, he, he, he is able to uh, just spin things up and accumulate a big stack. And even when he messes up, he still has a lot of chips. So that's the good news for Rigby there. Yeah, Rigby is a lot of fun. Uh, obviously, we'll get into that hand later on. But yeah, this is a big spotlight episode. There's an interview with him. Uh, you see quite a few hands with him messing around the 7-6, getting some guy to fold. You know, <laughs> it's just kind of funny. Uh, yeah, I mean, we also get Aldemir showing up for the first time. 
uh, in a little Jeff Platt segment that just essentially shows that Aldemir is just sort of rolling through the tournament, getting a lot of hands, mm -hmm. busting even his friends out, but still just remaining focused. So this is where Aldemir's storyline starts to build a bit. Yeah, it's it's a pretty good episode. You know. Yeah, I mean, so really, I mean, the score was 3-1. So I, I, I was, even though I was let down by episode three, I thought, okay, episode four kind of makes up for it almost. So I, I was optimistic heading to day six, knowing some of the players that were going to be in the action at that point. Uh, unfortunately, uh, once again, Chidwick gets eliminated before the episode begins. Really annoying. Uh, Aldemir uh, and Jensen and Jareth East are at the table one. But I don't, didn't really find any of the action here really all that memorable. I mean, Aldemir you know, rules the world, which he kind of does a whole up the whole season, so it's not really all that uh, surprising. And uh, Dragon Alim is kind of the, the main character of Table Two. But and I'll, I'll be honest, it's just not 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 fun watching her lose hands. I mean, it, it was kind of similar to 2016, where like Gil Bowman and Melanie Wisner kept losing hands. Like you're rooting for the last lady in the tournament, and so when they chipped down, she had a lot of chips too. She really could have, you know changed gears and maybe lasted a lot longer and it was just not fun to watch her her her, her uh, chip down like that um and despite the fact that the eliminations are kind of counted down almost one by one for the rest of the broadcast uh i just thought this episode kind of main with uh, embodied all the main flaws of this entire season in one episode yeah i don't mind counting down the bus stats again especially as you're getting closer and closer to the final table i think that's kind of neat but again, there's just nothing that interesting about the bus stats. You know, you just sort of see the player leave. You know, John Smith got 89th place. You know, Chris Smith got 88th place. It's like, all right, well, who are they? How did they do in the tournament? Did they just get unlucky at the end? It would have been nice to have had that context in there. Yeah, Shinwick just being thrown in, you know, help me busted, moving right along. Here's Dragana Lim now. It's just really disappointing. You know, Dragana Lim does get a nice interview. She talks about creating an animal foundation and how she's going to donate her money for that which is you know kind of nice but yeah it would have been again nice to just can we see her play like what is she like as a player does she bluff does she not bluff Things i mean like when we see her bluff that's that's for sure but i would have loved to have seen her accumulate the 10 million chips that she had or whatever and also she was shown on the our table like every episode up until this point and then we finally see her and it's not all that fun to watch her on that table at all yeah um so and so by episodes end we're, we're down to 67 players and then for tape for day six part two uh, this is um, another episode where just the majority of the hands are just all ins or mostly mad hands. Right. And all in hands can be fun, but when it's all in pre flop, for example, it's not nearly as enjoyable. Uh, but uh, besides the Rigby content on table one, I didn't really think any other part of this episode was all that much fun. I have no highlights for table three, outer tables, the second table two that gets, that gets formulated later in the episode. Uh, so and again, I'm not suggesting that um, the Rigby content isn't really good, but uh, we're talking maybe like 15 minutes of a 45 minute episode. So if one third episode's good, the rest of it's not good. It's not really a good episode. Yeah, there is. There's one Norm joke I like, and it's one of my favorite Norm jokes ever. So they have this segment with this guy, Daniel Swartz who's this recovering heroin addict and, you know, they give him a little segment. And then the very next hand, they show him uh, doubling up against Jareth East with eights versus King 10 in a situation where it's a flip. And Norm says, well, why would we introduce the guy and then knock him out? That would be cruel and unusual punishment. It's like, it's funny to see like a little meta joke in there. I think that's kind of nice. But yeah, other than um, which, you know, other than the Rigby stuff, that that one joke is nice. Uh, you know, Dragana Lim does bust out in this episode with Ace King river, versus uh, Ace Queen. Uh, but, you know, it's just like there's just too much footage that's missed of her to really get the good sense of her fall, you know, where she went from 10 million in chips to zero million. Uh, so you know, it doesn't really land as effectively as it could have. But yeah, I mean, if, if you're watching the live content, you're talking like, you know, eight, 10 hours every day. And they're constantly telling you the chip counts and who the last ladies are in the field and players run the field. I feel like that, okay, you, you didn't see her play too many hands, but you she was present enough in the overall collective production that it was okay. Whereas here, it's really just like, oh, there's Lim, there's Lim, there's Lim in the outer fields. And then, oh, here she is. Different story, I think. It works definitely for the audience than, than how it might play out otherwise. Yeah, absolutely. It's and then I felt that, so by episode six, so we're almost halfway into 15 episodes, we really only knew like three or four players by this point. Yeah. Like there was no, there's no personality to the, to the field in a sense. I mean, we knew Rigby, we knew, I guess maybe Aldemir a little bit, and we knew some of the other top pros by just knowing the top pros that were still in there, but we didn't really know too many personalities. 
And so there was lacking that sort of personal connection from the player to the audience that we love so much in those old main events. So, but I, I do think we do need to at least discuss the dirty diaper hand because it is so, it is arguably the, it's probably the best hand of this whole main event. Is that, is that what yeah. that is? Yeah, I mean, I remember watching this live. Uh, this was just so sick to see with the three deuce. I mean, yeah, if you haven't seen the hand, I'm pretty sure the live version's on YouTube. I'm sure now the edited version's on YouTube. Yeah. It's just crazy. I mean, it's it's just, it's just so much fun. <laughs> it's so good. It's a great hand. And I, I wonder if I was in Jensen's shoes, would I have made that call? I mean, it's easy for me to say, oh yeah, of course I would. But if I, if I thought about it, I mean, it's, you know, obviously Rigby, you, it depends on what your knowledge of Rigby was given the flow of information when you're playing versus, you know, watching. I mean, if you're playing in the tournament, you might have friends with you watching the stream or something. That's iffy. Um, and obviously on an ace high board, but, it, you know, you have to think, why would he shove an ace if he wants you to call? Yeah. Because there's no draws, really. So I, I don't know. I mean, you could probably break it down, GTO, some, some, bull, some bull and figure out, Maybe you can need to call there, but it is you do you do have three million chips left if you fold twenty five big blinds. So I guess you know it, it's not not the end of the world if you fold, but I don't know. I, I think it's it's not as obvious a fold as some players might think. Yeah, I mean, so Jensen makes it three hundred twenty five k with kings. Rigby raises to nine twenty with three deuce. Jensen tanks for a little bit. There's a bit of table talk. Jensen says, "Oh, you've got ten four again," and Rigby says, "Stronger." So then off of that talk, Jensen raises it to 2.1 million. Rigby calls. It's an ace high flop. And I remember when the flop was dealt out and I saw the ace. I'm like, Rigby's going to win this hand. <laughs> Jensen's going to fall with an ace high flop. Uh, so Rigby shoves. Jensen tanks for a little bit, then folds and Rigby shows. I mean, yeah. I mean, what is Rigby calling, you know, a four bet with, uh, you know, on an ace high board? I mean, yeah, if he's got, if he does have an ace, yeah. I mean, I think maybe he would let you hang it with, hang yourself with kings i mean i don't know it's just it's a tough spot i mean i i guess maybe he he bets an ace strong so like maybe you fold a slightly better race like if he has a six he wants you to fold ace eight yeah i don't know but even, but even then you're chopping so many times anyway so i don't know i mean rigby obviously we're just going to go for it no matter what and he he lucked into that chance and checked and then rigby had enough chips to obviously put them all in and the pot odds, you know the, the all in makes sense given like if it wasn't like if you bet like 10 million into 4 million versus you that's only has three million behind, so that right. kind of makes so it, it's a tough spot, obviously. Uh, but when it's your main event and you're at the final like 50, 60 players, whatever it was, it's a tough spot. But props to to uh, Rigby for for playing the hand like that, even though he gets kind of punished karmically by Aldemir when Ruby flops a flush and then Aldemir uh wins it, runs him out with uh, the ace of hearts. So, uh, again, everything just going well for Aldemir the whole way through. And uh, Rigby still has some chips after that hand, but obviously uh, it was an impactful clash of two big names at that point. In that hand. Absolutely. So, some good Rigby action this episode, but that's only one third of the episode. So is it, you gotta, you gotta look at it that way. Yeah. yeah. Episode seven is the third part of day six. And uh, here we do lose Rigby and his victim Jensen afterwards. Although Rigby actually does not outlast the player that he, uh, that he bluffed. Uh, and for this episode, there was probably the most table three and at our table action of any episode up until this point, which, you know, hurts because I really just can't, I didn't, couldn't stand any of that action at all. I mean, there was a lot of bust outs and, and just hands shown. And the only elimination that I even remotely cared about was Rigby's elimination. Yeah, I mean, Jensen busting isn't really a huge, he seems like a nice guy afterward, you know, say, wish, you know, wish, I wish that one of you wins. And of course, knowing that Aldemir is going to win, that's, you know, wish yeah. comes true. Uh, but yeah, I mean, Rigby busting, yeah, it's, you know, kind of a shame uh, calling, calling it off with King Queen up against Ace Deuce, which, you know, I would have followed the King Queen. Uh, it's just me. I know. And yeah, I know. he seemed like, he seemed like an affable enough guy that, you know, definitely brought the three Deuce to the WSOP, which is nice. But yeah, I mean, nothing else that's, you know, super interesting, um, you know, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and there was also an error where Lon said a guy was knocked out in 59th place when it was actually 57th place. So, again, oh. a, a little production error there. Um, I, there was a couple of bits I, I thought was okay. There was a tribute to Orenstein, the guy who pioneered. We talked about him briefly during our documentaries episode a while back about his role in poker television. 
And uh, they did have the sort of, they compared the speed of bust outs year to year, as far as the pace of play, as far as how many players were left by that point. That's interesting, I guess, because every year you have a different, you know, sometimes players get lucky and never bust out and then the, the action slows down, sometimes they don't. So, you know, compare them a little bit. But again, I thought it was mostly another, another dead episode. So by this point, the duds have outweighed the not duds, which is unfortunate, but uh, going forward here. So there was one final uh, episode for day six. So there's four episodes, which is pretty standard, really. Uh, this went from the final five tables down to the final four tables, which is what they established as day seven begins with 36 players left instead of 27, which again, pace of play, you have to make that call as a director. So I understand that. Uh, but I have literally, for the perhaps the first time in my notes ever, zero true hand highlights in my notes. Like I almost always I find at least something to note, whether it's a hand or an observation or something someone said. I literally have nothing for this episode. Uh, yeah, I mean, small things. Uh, you know, a guy shoves against Aldemir with King Queen, and Aldemir calls with a six, and Norm makes some joke. At least if I move in preflop, no one can outplay me. I thought that was kind of a nice little joke. Huh. Uh, we have a segment with Chase Bianchi where he, he comes off like a very nice guy. He's he runs like a foster care, just does foster care with twelve different kids. So that's very nice of him. Seems like a sweet guy. Um, yeah. You know, this is mainly just kind of a, I, I don't want to say a filler episode, but yeah, to kind of just get us through the end of this day, get through these bust outs, have a little bit more of action for Aldemir and uh, Remedio is also pops up here and there. Uh, but yeah, nothing super special. Well, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned Bianchi because this episode had two players that have some connection in some way to Adam Grosak, who I was obviously in Vegas of that year. Uh, uh, Chase Bianchi, Adam did name drop. He's played with him before. Uh, saying he's you know was very impressed by his skills, and then table one had Tony Roder, who mm -hmm. was at Adam's day three table, at the start of day three. So I, I knew that he made a deep run. So I guess I was kind of happy to see him in the action, even if he busts in this episode. But nonetheless, so it's just as close to an Adam connected episode. There really weren't any players besides Dragon Limb that I had any sort of interaction or story with in Vegas that were present besides. The Adam connections there so that was something but I gotta say these four episodes for day six and it collectively probably forms one of the weakest day six episode collections we've seen maybe like one notch above 2019 but that was really for me it was pretty pretty weak yeah it was pretty weak uh and then so day seven with four tables left you actually just have one table for the outer table by this point because you know it's the main three tables plus the one extra one and uh, this first episode does get us down to that magical three tables left number uh, over the course of one level. And so you, one theme I noticed was just some pretty awful bad short stack play here. Yeah, I think a lot of day seven short stacks not really uh, playing their last few big blinds very well. And it's funny, I actually forgot that Dobrik made the final table in 2022. I thought yeah. he was here, so I was like, wait a minute, he's out now? Oh, he makes it back to back. That's really impressive. He kind of does the inverse of Lococo uh from, from from this year to next year so i guess that was kind of funny um there was one uh player we kind of knew jonathan dweck who, who wore this roman costume in the main event pass that we kind of knew but for the most part the only players that i had like passed outside knowledge of really was just chance corneth besides yeah. dweck here so not a field i'm super in love with in the first place and uh obviously you know there's a few players we've seen play for days four and five and six but not I feel that I was particularly attached to at any level. Yep, same here. Yeah, I mean, uh, Kalilis was maybe a name that I've heard vaguely in the past because he won the Poker Stars Championship. Um, yeah, but, you know, nothing Nothing I was super attached to here. No real horses in the race. When I was watching it live, I remember seeing George Holmes in some hands thinking, like, this guy's got some moves. Like, I like this guy. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, I mean, the you know, there's, he does a couple of, of good moves. Uh, against Park, for example, right at the end of the episode, you know, he's definitely maneuvering his stack here and there. Uh, but it just in terms of it, I just if I was just looking at the edit of this of somebody to root for, I didn't really have anybody. I mean, Aldemir seems like he's a good player, but we don't really get enough of his personality or his story to really understand anything. I wouldn't have guessed off of the coverage thus far about who makes the final table based off of the edit. Uh, you know, it just seems very all over the map. Uh, so yeah, I mean, it's just, just kind of confusing. There was one running gag of, of East arriving day seven late. That was, I guess, kind of amusing, I guess, as you know, a little comedy there. 
Uh, but uh, otherwise, you know, Chance Corneth kind of rules the world in Table One, knocking out a couple players with some lucky runouts. And then, uh, but I don't know if you noticed this, but there was a uh, towards the very end of the episode, we see Corneth just magically go from thirty million down to twenty million. And that was like, yeah. was curious, how could we lose ten million? But to the episode ten's credit, they, they show out of order a hand where Corneth loses ten million chips, and so it explains how. He dropped that 10 million, which is still, you know, it's a good 30 plus big blinds by this point. So it's not an insubstantial number. But so I, I was happy that that was actually shown, but I was confused why they couldn't just show it in order and put it in the appropriate episode. But I'm not an editor, so whatever. Yeah, I mean, I remember watching Chance Corneth again live when I was watching this, being like, oh, he's going to make the final table. He's going to win. Like, I was just, I was expecting him to just close out. And yeah, based off of the, again, the edit, I would say that if I had to make a guess, again, not knowing who would make the final table, I would have guessed Corneth makes it mm -hmm. uh, just off of, again, how much of a focus he gets, which just really goes to show how bad a lot of the other final tables got in edit. And we've talked so little about Henry Park and Remedio and Bianchi and Jareth East and people like that. Yeah, I mean, you get a bit more personality from, from Lococo. He gives, he does his rap, Papa MC, and his rap of, of, of his interview. So that was, again, something would have liked to say maybe a little bit earlier. That way, you could, you know, they could show more. They, they can say he's a rapper in an earlier episode and then show him rap afterwards in, you know, around here. That way, you know, it kind of gives us a bit more of a drip feed of who he is as a person. Um, I, I didn't think this was a bad episode. I just didn't think it was kind of hollow action, empty calories where. Stuff happens, players bust, there's 22 left, but there's no real, there's no, no real narratives here. No one's trying to go back to back. No one's trying to, you know, uh, prove someone else wrong or, you know, overcome an adver adverse, uh, adversity or, or something that just chip stacks just kind of flow and nothing really, you know, stands out off the page to me. Yeah, I mean, for the guy who winds up winning Aldemir, there's just so little in episodes, you know, nine and ten about him. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I don't. I mean, looking at my notes here, like there's just barely anything. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, again, it's so hard to guess who's going to make it to the end or not based off of all this and what what the storylines are or anything. And yeah, there's sure there's a few, you know, moments here and there of Lococo or George, you know, George Holmes. We finally see him get crippled against Oliver, uh, but nothing super exciting or anything to hang your hat on. I mean, there, there, we do see this episode that where George Holmes gets knocked down to less than two big blinds. So I guess that's, you know, and then and then he, he we only actually see one of his double ups before right. back to 10 million chips, which is like 25 big blinds. So, I, I mean, there was your chance right here. The guy who was going to make the final table and finish in second is down to 1.5 big blinds. We have 20 something players left. Great. Let's show each exactly each and every hand where he doubles up. So we see his you know, energy and vibe increase. And we skip almost all of it in favor of just a montage for a remedial losing chips off screen before he, he wins more back. And then we'll just cut to George Holmes later. Oh, he's at 10 million now. He's fine now. Like, you, you, you really had a chance there to make something of that story. Yeah, it's a letdown. And then episode 11, again, a bit better because, you know, we see some mini day seven narratives. For, when I say mini narratives, I mean like someone was, you know, at this chip stack, went down, back up, you know, it, like we see enough hands of them consecutively so there's only so many players left that we're, you know, there's a bit more of a, moving the episode, okay, they're they're doing better, they're doing worse. That, because there's only three tables left to really show, so it just makes things easier. But, right. um, uh, and, and so, to my surprise though, they don't show a single hand from table one in the first 60% of this episode. So it's just dedicated entirely to basically to table two with a little bit of uh, table three shown in there. And probably the best uh, table three hand of the whole season was a hero call by Knip against East. Yeah. Uh, only be, I mean, it was a little bit awkward because I showed kind of two screens of each player. It wasn't quite edited in the, in the way that the main event usually is shown. But uh, I thought at least it was a good hero call by Knip. That was a good hand to show at least for table three. Yeah, I mean, we start to see the the fall of Kalilis a little bit uh, with Aldemir getting him to fold the top pair. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we start to see him kind of, you know, lose some pots here and there. Uh, so that's, yeah, but again, that's not super called out in the narrative. This isn't really something that, it's more something that I've noticed less than right. the show's trying to get us to notice. They really try to make Remedio seem like he's this like great, nice guy. They give him a lot of coverage at the start of this episode. And yeah, again, he seems like a nice guy. I'm sure he's a decent player, but we're being told this information very late into the season. We don't see it steadily developed throughout, which is sort of thrown in with us. 
And the same with Kniff. I mean, in the previous episode, episode 10, we get a plot segment about him. We get an interview with him. He seemed like a very nice guy, like, to, you know, no problem with him at all. Yes. But all this information is just thrown into this in these two episodes. And then we see him bust toward the end. It's like if you had sh shown us this footage steadily throughout the coverage, then we would really start to like him better versus, you know, right before the end, you give him all this footage. It's like in a drama when a character is going to die and that episode focuses more on them than somebody else. It's like, it's like, you know, the poker equivalent of that. And it just doesn't land as effectively as if you'd steadily develop this. Yeah. I mean, we felt that the 2017 main event, the first of the poker go era was kind of a factory produced. Let's just show the, we're going to show day one to the final table and we'll just sort of put a bunch of stuff together and it'll, it'll work. This one, I, I did feel there was effort put into this to this one. I mean, they only have day four onward, so there's a bit less dilution of the whole tournament. There's a bit more attention to the action within the day. But uh, they just, I think that they had their hearts in the wrong place as far as showing us what we think really matters. You know, the poker matters. I'm not saying it doesn't, but, but the player in the hand matters just as much as the cards do. Right. So that's, that's a good point. Yeah. And so uh, partway into the episode, the final three tables morph into two. And Aldemir, I got to say, he looks like a million times more badass of shades and no like pink mask on or whatever. Like it is insane how much of a switch was flipped there when he made that image change. It is, isn't it? I'm, I'm interested in why he made that change. Because, you know, I remember when um, Van Hoof at the final table puts on shades and his game just fell apart for the handed. Uh, you know, it's interesting whenever somebody makes a style change like that. But um yeah, I mean, obviously it's a bit, you know, the edit's a bit skewed so that Aldemir has a bigger edit later on. But yeah, he seems to do better after the change is made, uh, which is pretty interesting. Yeah. Uh, so the episode ends with 16 players left. So we only have one episode to cover the final seven bust outs, which really is a shame because I, I feel like a good penultimate episode before the final table should maybe have three or four bust outs in it. Yeah. That way, uh, you can kind of... Because you know, the bubble is such an important part of the final table that you want to have a good amount of time covering it, assuming there was enough time, enough hands for that to actually you know, matter. But uh, un unfortunately, so this episode covers three blind levels and seven knockouts, and the, the bust outs are evenly split between tables one and table two. But um, so, so the bust outs finally mean something here, because for the most part, we've seen most of these players here and there. I mean, Amarapu a little bit on day seven only. Chance Corneth pretty regularly here. Kalilis, you know, pretty pretty prominently shown during day seven. But uh, the eliminations became well, the eliminations in real life. They came in a relatively short clip in real in real time. So it, it probably makes the episode feel a bit less rushed than it could have had it been the other way around. Uh, unfortunately for me, the bubble just wasn't all of that interesting. It was only the last nine minutes of the episode. The player who was in tenth place busts in tenth. Uh, it was about half an hour of real play in real life. So it was, you know, you know, it was only so much, but I, I love the bubble content so much. That it was a shame that that, was a, that wasn't much to it. Yeah. I mean, in, speaking about the bust stats before we get to the bubble, I mean, yeah. Horneth busts, uh, you know, running ace king into aces, uh, you know, that's the only bust out that I felt like really was consequential or mattered. Amarapu had been, you know, sort of weaving in and out of the coverage. Yeah. He was an amateur. I think he's from Boston or something. So, mm -hmm. you know, that's kind of interesting to get these little tidbits, but nothing super impactful about it. Kalilis busting, again, there's this sort of unspoken narrative of him having a big stack and then dropping out. But again, nothing super emotional or interesting. Halverson, like I didn't really care about him busting. Uh, Ragazzini, I didn't care about him busting, and then the guy who gets tenth, I didn't care about. So, well, you 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 actually left out the one biggest one of all of them here, Onikal. Yeah, because I, I was wondering in this episode, just how is Onikal with fifty million chips going to miss the final table? So I know he didn't miss the final table, and yeah. I see a flush against a full house, blind against blind, one of the biggest hands pot size wise until the final table of the whole tournament. Aldemir hits one hundred and twenty two million by the end of that hand which even if he had just did that milk would have been the chip leader of the battle by a mile. Right. Uh, so that was a pretty big hand, I guess. Um, I mean, I thought it was an okay episode overall, besides the, the bell being let down, but it wasn't enough to salvage the whole season, really, because, again, we've had some amazing uh, final episodes before the bubble, like in 2018, even with Rich Zoo and uh, Labatt. Uh, and that, you know, often is a highlight of the whole season. You have Carlos Mortensen busting out in 10th in a heartbreaking fashion, just missing out on the table, other things like that. And uh, 
So again, not a bad episode. It wasn't rushed, if you ask me. Some okay, you know, transcorrent busting is going to exist. Big deal. Okay, but uh, uh, it was it was not um, as good as it could have been. Yeah, I completely forgot about the onical hand. <laughs> yeah, I just just you know saying that in my notes. Yeah, that's that's pretty sick that that happens. Uh, but you know, that's just what happens. Yeah. yeah, and then the bubble itself. I mean, yeah, we only get. You know, we get this weird hand against Holmes versus Aldemir where the dealer starts pushing the chips toward Holmes before Aldemir has done an action, which I thought was, you know. That was, that was memorable. That was, that was unique for sure. Yeah, it's a little memorable. Yeah, I mean, this episode isn't terrible, but again, I mean, as we're getting to the final two tables, I want to get like a real emotional sense like, oh, you know, that guy finished 12th place. Darn, I was really hoping he'd make it. Uh, but we don't get that here. No. Uh, so, you know, Aldemir just, you know, on a cult just... I mean, you got to get away from that. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, and so um, really, there, there were there were two great opportunities in day seven to really cover. One was you could have shown that George Chelan's big comeback. That he, he becomes like the second biggest stack at the final table. Yep, could have really had a great story there. And also, Park was the chip leader uh, at the start of day seven, or one of the chip leaders. And we don't really see anything of his study fall. I mean, if you look at his chip counts, yeah, it's going down you know, over. Episode, episode, we're not really seeing it. So you could have had like a good, you know, one of those narratives there that we don't see. So it's a bit of a letdown again. Um, not the, not, not again, day seven, not terrible, but again, it's just kind of in that, that C, C minus ground that I really think day seven can do better. Yeah. And, you know, Aldemir is at 140 million, Holmes is at 83 million, and the chips are fairly spread out amongst the remaining players uh you know you could really sell that you know story of like these two players have you know combined 50 percent of the chips at the final table you know really let that play out a little bit more interesting uh, but they don't do that and so going over i guess our subjective analysis of how well we know the final nine i mean it's funny i kind of like kept confusing east and oliver because yep. they're just kind of there they're they're youngish white guys i mean oliver is very stoic East was late that one time, but really, I mean, you could just kind of swap their roles and all the other stuff that you wouldn't change anything really. Um, and so, the, you know, how much more personality? Lococo, probably like personality wise, is, is the most unique. Yep. If only because of his background and the rapping. Aldemir, he definitely got the most poker focus out of all nine as far as hands played, hands won, hands lost, et cetera. And obviously, the most chips was going to be in the action the most. So I, I guess you kind of can kind of give Aldemir a pass because he just he's a top is a you know a top pro and he's you know in the action so much so I give him you know we'll give him we'll give him some points for that but and then Holmes uh, I mean he definitely comes across as a nice guy I think you know we could have gotten a few more minutes of interviews or of, of hand showing to really and to, to to pound that in but I mean okay I he's you know probably average considering how many main events we see some very unfocused on mild tables. Uh, Bianchi, he kind of had that one spotlight episode about his, you know, his family situation, adoption, and you know, he, he does, you know, he, he's a bit talky at the table. Probably, probably one of the, the, the more talkier players of the of the nine at the table, from what we saw at least. But uh, everybody else, really, I just don't have much to say about them. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, Sichelmish is Turkish. <laughs> That's about it. He seems like he's got glasses. He seems like a nice guy. Park, again, had that sort of narrative, like, he's the former Marine, he's going to be the chip leader at the start of this, but we don't really see him do anything. Uh, and then Remedio, yeah, as I mentioned, you know, we're, we're given a couple segments where it's like, he's got a big rail, he's a nice guy, but again, we don't, we don't... I mean, all, nine, all nine of these guys are nice guys by, yeah. you know, TV standards. No one's... Yeah, there's no there's villain at it here. I mean, no all of them are, yeah, there's Holmes nothing. and Oliver, you know, definitely seem to be on like the Shire side of things. They're not super outspoken, which again is totally fine. But it just again, sort of like luck of the draw. You know, two of your final three players are just not big talkers, and then Aldemir isn't a big talker at the table either. So you're just not, you know, just just bad luck here in terms of just personalities. And then Lococo, uh, you know. Yeah, he seems like, a, you know, he, he's animated when he wins hands. He's a rapper. He's willing to be a little bit talkative. But, like, he's the most, he's the most personable person here. And he's, you know, I'm, I'm having all these caveats. I know. It's, it's just, really, again, like, look at the draw. It's just not really good. I totally agree. So it's a, it's a pretty weak characterization of the final table uh, we've had. I think, you know, it's definitely on, on probably on my, on my list of some of my least favorite final tables. I mean, uh, I'm, I'm happy that Adam knows Bianchi, I guess. But, I mean, that's, really, that's all I got, really. 
Um, yeah. So again, this final table, as this kind of been the new formula, they spend three episodes for the final table, not always adhering to the three day structure of the final table that, that, that had been standard for a while. In fact, this final table specifically, their plan had been to be on two nights. One, the first night playing down to four players and the second night playing down to a winner. And play progressed fast enough that with that first night, they actually played down to the final three instead of four because of just how early in the action things were progressing. And so episode one, for me, is probably the weakest of the three episodes of the final table. Yeah. Uh, the pacing is okay. Uh, it's not nearly as slow as 2019. There's fewer raise and takes shown. And everybody gets in the edit at some point, which I guess is kind of nice. Um, but uh, I just thought it was, it just was kind of a, a lackluster first part. Yeah, I mean, Bianchi and East bust pretty early on. Uh, you know, they were both on the shorter ends of things. Neither of them got much going. And then after that, yeah, there's just not too much. I mean, we learned a little bit more about homes and where the show and the lights slogan comes from we see lococo quite a bit in a couple segments and lococo manages to actually start to chip up a little bit uh which again i remember watching live being like hmm maybe this guy uh, maybe it'll be heads up between aldemir and lococo and of course i'm i'm sitting here thinking like i want it to be homes lococo heads up like that would just be cool uh because i was i was pulling for homes i'm like one big blind the main event champion that would just be so sick um but yeah i mean in the edit you know we learned that Aldemir's rail has a bunch of shirts that say, you know, KO Rye on it, uh, which I actually think is a pretty cool graphic. But, uh, you know, that's really about it. There's nothing super. The hands kind of just play themselves. Chips kind of get moved around a little bit. Holmes chips down a little bit, but he's still third in chips at the end of the episode. You know, nothing too Yeah, good. Park was one of the short stacks. He does chip up and avoids going out in one of the first few spots there. So he probably had arguably the best you know, starting chip to ending results performances of the nine. Uh, Aldemir just kind of maintains the chip lead the whole time. It's never really in any danger. Uh, and again, you, a lot of them kind of say like Aldemir keeps getting big hands and key spots or getting everything just kind of wins all the flips that he's a part of. And, uh, you know, it's definitely true for the most part. Um, uh, the one little comedic sort of thing we should, we, we did see was sort of like fake headlines for like if each player won the main event, what, what the headline would be. That's kind of cool, I guess. But uh, uh, because the episode doesn't end with a bust out, it just kind of ends with a whimper as a result. I mean, Holmes wins a medium pot against Aldemir, but doesn't really change the final table's landscape at all. And, uh, you know, your Lococo had gone from the middle of the pack into second place in chips by this point. And so uh, it does set up episode 14 decently in that Lococo goes loco, and uh, ends up busting in seventh place, making a pretty awful call on the river with um, a couple of tens on like a jack, jack, nine flop board that uh, Aldemir uh, shoves with, with the with you know, a full house of pocket nines. He was second in chips. If he had folded on the river, he still would have been okay, big blinds wise. And so uh, it was a pretty shocking, for even though I knew it was coming, I was, I was still pretty shocked to see that happen. Yeah, I saw that live. That was just like, oh, he just lit his stack on fire. Because, you know, you're you're winning a bunch of small pots. You're chipping up. You have a good stack. Uh, you know, I remember I remember when just like pre-flop seeing 10s versus 9s. I'm like, all right, Solomir's going to lose a little bit here. That's nice. And then the 9 comes. I'm like, yeah. And he, he also like, he like almost snap called. Like he tanked for like maybe five seconds in real life and then called. Like I remember seeing that going like, oh my God, really? He must have just thought that Aldemir was bluffing. Um, yeah, he had to there, yeah. Um, and then with with that, I think looking at the pay jumps, this might have been one of the least enjoyable pay jump final table I've ever seen. Like the pay jumps were pretty much a joke for the. I mean, they gave a million dollars for ninth place, and you don't really get to two million until like I feel like fifth place or something ridiculous. And even then, I just felt like even though the first prize was eight million dollars. Like even second place felt small at like four point three or whatever it was. It just yeah, I didn't, it's, so small. it's a vibe feel, but just if you looked at the page, it just didn't feel right to me. Yeah, to I mean they just want to have all the, the they want to have the final nine be millionaires, but it makes it depresses the pay jumps and also depresses first place. So it's just like okay, you're playing for. $150,000, you know, that's not super. And again, you know, I know it's a little weird optically to see like two young people talking about like, oh, $150,000, but like 
when you're playing for eight million, when you're at the final table of a world championship, you know, there should be a little bit more in there. And then, yeah, you know, see Chilmish and uh, Remedio and Park busting are just like, all right, you know, they're all nice people. Uh, they try, you know, Remedio has this like weird little sunglasses thing, which I didn't think was funny. I thought it was like more like grandstanding than anything else. That was, um, that was a lot. Yeah. Um, but, you know, so I, actually I, I felt that this was a very bipolar episode. I thought there were three like really big highlights and everything else was, was just dull. So you had the Lococo ham was a big one. I thought, I thought the shove by Remedio was pretty funny with the with, with that. He ends up beating Kings of 10-9 suited, which is pretty funny. Yeah, and, that's funny. And then hand number 124, the whole thing, was that pretty wild three-way all-in where Jack Oliver triples up, Aldemir's queens lose to both hands, and Armido gets crippled. So no one no one busts, and Oliver finally shows emotion for the first time. Well, that was a pretty big hand, so I'll give him credit. That's probably, if you ask me, maybe the second or third best hand of this, of this entire season, if you ask me. Um, so again, three highlights, but there's like maybe like 10 or 11 hands in the episode, and I like three of them, so... You know, again, the ratio of good to bad. But, I mean, they're pretty darn good, though. So uh, I, I think it's still a good episode in the end because of the, the entertainment value of those three hands for me. Yeah. But yeah. not enough to make up for part one, of course. Yeah, I did not see the uh, the three-way all-in live. Uh, so I actually forgot about that. I'm like, oh, that was pretty cool. I forgot about that. Yeah, uh, yeah it would have been, you know, on the other hand, pretty sick to see Aldemir, you know, bust out the other two guys. And then, you know, they go heads up. Uh, right. Holmes and Aldemir. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, it was, it was interesting hand to watch. Yes. Uh, and then, so we get to the final part of the final table, episode 15, uh, blinds only get as big as 1.2 million and 2.4 million, which is still, you know, low compared to the last couple of main events. Uh, by episodes beginning, Aldemir has 265 million ships, Oliver 77 million and Holmes 57 million. Now, I want you to remember that because at, by the second hand of this episode, we have skipped so much action that Holmes is suddenly more than double that, and Oliver is less than one third of what of that. So Holmes is all of a sudden at 128 million, Oliver 20 million. And again, I just can't stand when you skip such a key part of the three-handed action, which is right at the beginning of it too. And when you don't get the whole story, you just kind of feel cheated. Absolutely, I'm absolutely with you. Yeah, uh, it's just very odd to have that decision. And it's not like the other hands that we really see are, are super essential to watch. Uh, so, yeah, I feel I feel Oliver got robbed of the edit here because you could get a little bit of sense of his personality, a little bit more sense of his play, you know, just nothing. I mean, I mean, he gets third place in the 2021 main event, and we just literally see nothing memorable from him the entire time of the edit. When he, there's no doubt he played a number of hands that we could have seen, and he was there pretty early in the edit too. And I, yeah. I didn't feel like we really were connecting with them at all. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, we go into heads up and, uh, you know, it's, it's a shame that Holmes couldn't pull it off. I'll just say that. I mean, Holmes does manage to take the chip lead. So Aldemir does not go wire to wire. And it's actually, you know, again, the coverage we see, you know, somewhat back and forth. Holmes managed to win a couple of spots. Aldemir manages to win in a couple of spots. And then the last hand happens. And it's just, it feels kind of anticlimactic to me. Uh, again, that's how it happened in real life that, you know, Holmes shoves with top pair. Aldemir manages to call with two pair. But it's just kind of like it robs any narrative thrust of anything. Because, you know, up till this point, you've had this Aldemir's Invincible narrative, then he loses a little bit. You've had this Holmes, you know, back from one big blind, now he's the chip leader of the World Series of Poker. And, like, just the last hand just means that, like, neither of those narratives truly get everything they deserve, because Holmes just kind of punched his stack off. I mean, you can't write reality. Yeah. I get that. But it just, you know, I mean, it, it was a unique permutation of how the final hand could play out. Right. Because uh, I, I guess maybe the closest was maybe like Eastgate Demidoff. Yeah. Guess, but nonetheless, I mean, there was no chance that Eastgate was folding or his Aldemir. I mean, he wasn't folding, but, you know, there was always that small chance he might. I mean, even though we probably knew he wasn't going to. Uh, you know, this is the, the heads up content. Was this is the last 27 minutes of the episode? It was 54 hands in real time, about three and a half hours. Uh, so, you know, uh, in the middle as far as how long heads up play can last sometimes. And compared to like the past heads up battles that were fairly lengthy, like at least two thirds of episode or longer, it's probably my least favorite of the content. So that really just includes Ryan Reese and Jay Farber, plus I think Veo and uh, Kui Win. Mm -hmm. uh, I, 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 and also um, 
uh, Pia Sainz and Martin Tedesco. So uh, compared to those, I thought this was definitely the least successful entertainment wise, because even though hands were, were working, you know, in both, both directions, I, I didn't feel like it was a true back and forth. I know, just maybe I, I know the ending, but I'm not sure. It just didn't, didn't quite gel as well as those past battles that the champ have been for me. Yeah. Cause it was just too abbreviated the, you know, that it's just homes with, you know, 194 million to start the hand is going to go all in with top pair. Uh, you know, yeah, I mean, the we also just got lucky. I mean, the couple main events before this, you know, 2019 was that big battle between San Martino and Ensign, and 2018 was the big battle between uh Miles and uh John Sin. So, I mean, we had we got so lucky with you know the couple main events that they were you know went on for nine hours each of those, uh, to have you know something last and you know again, real time, I think it was like less than an hour or so. Uh, you know, it's a little unfortunate, yeah. I mean. Again, Aldemir played well. You know, I'm not trying to take anything from him. George Holmes also played well. But just, you know, having that just kind of end on a, you know, kind of whimper sort of summarizes the whole main event of, in a way that there's all this potential. There's all this could have been great narratives throughout, and it just kind of doesn't get there. There's not enough force there. I mean, it was well, they were actively trying to not show the stories that I was trying to grab onto. Like they would take some moneymaker. Oh, great. He's at the table table. And then let's just not show him anything, anything out on the outer tables at all. Let's just cut that out of the edit entirely. And yep. that was a conclusion to that. I mean, I'm, I'm okay with, with players I enjoy seeing play busting. I can deal with that, but I want to see the whole, the whole narrative, not just, you know, the first part of it. And so it was a little frustrating. Uh, I, again, I wasn't bored for most of his episode and his episodes. Just, I, was, I was just let down by the decisions they made when they were choosing what, what hands to put in, what hands to not put in. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I put this toward, you know, somewhere in the bottom half of the main events we've covered. I would have to really look through them again to see where the ranking is. There's definitely some, you know, plenty of good moments weaving in and out of here. Lana Norm's banter is pretty good. Jeff Platt's pretty good. Uh, you know, nothing terrible on the technical level, nothing great on the technical level in terms of graphics and music. Um, yeah, there's just, again, there's a lot of potential here for what could have been a lot more entertaining and educational of a poker experience. And it's just not quite there. Uh, I'll be curious to see how the, the 2022 main event turns out. Cause I barely remember that other than that all of my horses going into the final, like hundred, all of them bust and don't make the main event final table. Like I barely remember the final table. I know that I remember Dobrich making it. And then I remember, you know, the tanking heads up, that's about it. So I'll be curious to see how 2022 turns out. But yeah, with this one, I, I had my hopes a little bit up. And just didn't quite get there. I mean, I was just ready to go. Those first two episodes roll around. I was happy. And then just it fell apart from there. Uh, yeah. I, I I put it above 2019 and above 2018. Uh, but I guess below 03, I suppose. I don't know. So it's kind of like, like for me, third to last. On yeah. That uh, so to kind of like that C minus level. So in that C category that we had so many of those later main events in when we did that ranking. But um you know, again, there's so much promise. So really, if they do elect to make an episode season of 2022, which I'm sure they'll do because they did it for 2021, uh, I really hope that they learn from their mistakes because uh, they really, I think they, the, the skeleton can work. That's what they, they pretty mean that they can, they can come back from the live ways back to the classic ways and, and, and do it again. But they have to really, uh, uh, think about the, the big big picture not just just the, the medium picture here and there that's my takeaway yeah absolutely I'm with you so guys hopefully you enjoyed our discussion about this uh you know bit of a let them miss this main, main event uh i did enjoy you know getting back to our roots here for this kind of uh podcast so uh, hopefully you guys can appreciate it uh as far as our next episode uh i think it's only fitting that we've covered poker tv poker movies, poker books, poker documentaries, poker vlogs, that it's only fitting that we throw in poker video games. We've talked about, we've no, we, we played a couple of poker video games over the course of our lives, but I, I, I bought this game used at a game shop for eight bucks. We're going to play it on the GameCube and we're going to see if we can become a main event champion in this game. And we're going to see how effective this can be as poker entertainment for the, for the, for the public. Yep, and next week we'll also be interviewing Phil Helmuth. April Fools. <laughs> you got me. You got me. Uh, now we'll we'll see if we get an interview in the future here. But uh, yeah. you know, I am I am a self proclaimed big gamer. Sam is a self proclaimed not a gamer, even though he's you know he's played a lot of games over the course of his life. 
And it's true. You have played a lot of games over the course of your life. You've played a lot of uh, Okay, games. yeah. I, I played a little bit of Team Fortress 2 in ninth grade. That's about it. <sighs> well, anyway, we will, we will talk about different poker video games besides besides the Worlds of Poker for the game. We played a couple other ones over the years that we'll discuss, too, compare and contrast. And maybe we'll talk about some poker news, too, if anything pops up, too. But we'll see what happens. But until then, guys, enjoy your poker, enjoy your TV, enjoy your poker on TV. Take care, everyone. And April Fool's. April Fool's. <laughs>